Today I will discuss the long-term outcomes after emergency revascularization for spontaneous coronary artery dissection. I have no conflicts of interest. This research project was funded by SCAD Research Incorporated and the Minneapolis Heart Institute Foundation. I would also like to acknowledge uh, the co-investigators for this project. Emergency percutaneous coronary intervention for SCAD is less successful compared to PCI for coronary atherosclerosis. Further, at follow-up, higher rates of instant uh, restenosis and thrombosis compared to atherosclerotic coronary disease have been reported. Based on these concerns and knowledge that SCAD often heals spontaneously, PCI is recommended only for high-risk patients. Nonetheless, emergent PCI is necessary in some circumstances, and the long-term outcomes is unknown. We evaluated patients with primary presentation of SCAD at the Minneapolis Heart Institute between 2002 to 2019 using a retrospective and prospective registry. A total of 118 consecutive patients were identified, with 63 having no attempt at revascularization and 55 having attempt at revascularization during their initial angiogram. There was no difference in traditional risk factors between revascularized and non-revascularized patients. There was a significant difference in the median follow-up between the two groups with 4.5 years for revascularized patients and 1.3 years for non-revascularized patients. This figure shows patients with attempted revascularization in blue and non-revascularized in red by year of their initial SCAD presentation. Beginning about 2014, several important observations were published. Recognition of type 2 SCAD, frequent spontaneous healing, and PCI-related complications in SCAD. Therefore, after 2014, shown with the arrow, more patients were recognized and treated conservatively. As you might expect, the patients undergoing revascularization were more complex with statistically significant lower ejection fractions, more frequent ongoing chest pain, stemmies, cardiogenic shock, and cardiac arrest, albeit the latter was not statistically significant. Consistent with previous publications, the most common artery involved was the LAD, although the left main was not rare. Proximal dissections were, and non-type 2 were more common in revascularized patients. While there was not a difference in the initial TIMI flow, most of the patients that were not revascularized had distal dissections. Proximal dissections and TIMI zero flow were the most common reasons for revascularization. Most patients underwent PCI with a drug-eluting stent. The median number of stents required was two with a median length of 45 millimeters. Three patients underwent cabbage after PCI was not successful. There was no statistical difference between revascularization management strategies for the combined endpoint of death, myocardial infarction, stroke, heart failure, transplant, or LVAD placement. The overall long-term outcomes were favorable. There was only one death occurring greater than five years from the index SCAD event. A total of five patients developed heart failure with two heart transplants and three LVAD placements. There was no difference in the rates on, based on their initial revascularization strategy. However, most revascularized patients had significant improvement in their ejection fraction with 80% having a normal EF. Despite favorable outcomes, SCAD patients had high resource utilization with 70% of revascularized patients and 51% of non-revascularized patients having either a repeat ED visit or hospitalization, most occurring within one year. 28% of revascularized patients had additional revascularization, with 18% being stent-related complications. 15% of the revascularization group had a recurrent SCAD event, with 9% requiring additional revascularization, whereas 8% of the non-revascularized group had a recurrent SCAD event, with only 1% requiring revascularization. Of the 55 patients undergoing revascularization at their initial angiogram, early complications included 16% with PCI extending their dissection, 16% with TIMI flow less than three in their target revascularization vessel, and 8% with a residual stenosis of greater than 70% in the target vessel. Late stent complications occurred in 18% of the patients with 2% having stent malapposition due to hematoma resorption, 14% having instant restenosis and 2% having acute stent thrombosis. 
poor patients or 6% of the conservatively managed patients underwent revascularization following a failed man conservative management approach, and none of these patients had any PCI complications. Patients who had instant restenosis had a higher median number of stents and were more likely to have bare metal stents. In conclusion, we identified 118 SCAD patients at the Minneapolis Heart Institute. The 55 patients receiving PCI were more likely to have cardiogenic shock, STEMI, a proximal dissection, ongoing chest pain, and a lower ejection fraction. Similar to other reports, we found high rates of both early and stent-related complications with 16% undergoing extension of their PCI, of uh, their dissection from PCI, and 18% requiring stent related intervention. Over 50% of the patients had a repeat ED or hospital admission for chest pain evaluation. Despite these complications, overall the patients did well. At most recent follow-up, revascularized patients had recovery of their initial lower ejection fraction. In addition, the overall total survival was 99% at a medium follow-up of three years. Our data supports that revascularization can be an appropriate management strategy for high-risk SCAD patients but initially higher rates of uh, SCAD complications should be anticipated.